morning uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks for being here for uh, this webinar. This is on uh, how to improve your ethics and compliance program in the healthcare sector. My name is Mike Volpa. I appreciate uh, everybody signing up for this. Um, I wanted to uh, first go, I have to spend a little bit of marketing time here before we get into this. Uh, first, uh, in terms of the changes in the webinar service that we provide at Volkoff Law, we started our own subscription-based uh, webinar service. Um, and uh, under the new sort of regime, this where we basically put together all the recordings that we have of all of our webinars so far. There are about there are 50 right now. And so it's a subscription-based webinar service now that you can watch when you, you know, what you want, when you want it. Um, and uh, I've included here the website for it. Um, there are 50 video webinars, and uh, they come along with, you can download a copy of the webinar slides or with each of the webinars. Um, we are still going to provide this service, meaning the, uh, the webinars, the live webinars, and we'll provide that for free. Um, but then after that, all recordings will be placed into the uh, webinar uh, TV service. Now, the subscription fee is $99 per month or $950 per year for unlimited access to all of the 50 webinars. And remember, we include a variety of topics. For example, uh, we've done webinars on internal investigations, how to set up systems, how to conduct high stakes investigations, how to conduct routine investigations. Uh, we've addressed uh, obviously lots of uh, ethics and compliance issues generally on uh, how to structure programs, how to do, put together an effective program. Uh, we've also detailed anti-corruption uh, issues as well and uh, in terms of specific issues related to due diligence. Uh, most of the webinars are, there are a lot of anti-corruption webinars as well. We also have addressed AML, anti-money laundering, uh, Bank Secrecy Act, and sanctions violations and programs that are needed uh, for that. Uh, each year as we go along, obviously, as I do the webinars during the year, we will uh, put them into the library so that the library will continue to grow. And of course, we have a, we have a discount option uh, if you subscribe. Uh, this month uh, you get and you use Volkov20 as your coupon code, uh, you will get a 20% discount. Um, we, uh, you know, I'm really excited about the service. It's a way, and I apologize for taking uh, our YouTube channel down, but, uh, you know, it takes time to put this together and uh, in terms of it takes time from my law firm activities. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we put together a good service and we're hopeful uh, we'd like to see people subscribe to it, and uh, any feedback we can get from you in terms of how to make it better. You may provide uh, more topics uh, as we go along, but we'll keep you posted on that. So we're going to have a, we'll continue with the free service, you know, in terms of the live service, and uh, and go from there. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, uh, if we could, is healthcare. And I wanted to do this uh, healthcare um, uh, compliance um, sort of suggestions on healthcare programs and compliance programs because we do work in this uh, area and we're happy to help people with, uh, you know, sort of taking their compliance programs to the next level. I've always, if you've heard me speak about this, I always feel like the False Claims Act is really sort of uh, your biggest threat, more so than if you're in the healthcare industry, if you're in pharma and medical device uh, devices, uh, you have an uh, anti-kickback law requirements that are really tough. Stark law uh, comes into play. Uh, but the False Claims Act really is sort of the driver, and the, and the government, uh, through the Health Care Reform Act of 2010, the Affordable Care Act, uh, basically got their wish list of False Claims Act uh, amendments to give the government even more power in the ability to uh, extract penalties out of people. Um, more importantly, uh, there's a real the announcement this past uh, last year that DOJ or this year that DOJ was going to review all KETAM filings and all potential False Claims Act cases for criminal cases is to me a real concern. 
and a real worry because uh, a lot of these cases, even though they're prosecuted civilly, could be brought criminally, and there could be individuals who could be brought, uh, you know, to bear uh, and prosecuted. And my concern with that is that healthcare companies have to get to the next level. So here we always start off with the numbers. The numbers look pretty bad. Uh, DOJ has been recovering over two billion dollars a year for the last five years under False Claims Act, uh, with all their new tools and their new provisions and their new uh, resources. So it is absolutely a concern. Over 700 key TAM uh, actions were filed uh, last year. In other words, these are complaints that are filed. The government has still not decided whether or not to intervene in those cases. You know that if the government intervenes in the case, they win 99% of the cases. Uh, frankly, they don't lose. Uh, last year, in the fiscal year uh, 2014, there was 496 criminal cases and 805 defendants. Um, and we know that the, uh, the OIG, the Inspector General, uh, for HHS is very, very active in this and actually is a huge risk uh, with regard to civil cases. And the ability to exclude, the exclusion authority means, and we have to be uh, very, uh, very honest about this, the fact that the government has the ability to exclude a company uh, for a violation means that a company just cannot go to trial. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, the company loses a trial. Uh, then they're going to be in a situation where you're excluded from all federal health care plans. And that can be uh, devastating to a business. And frankly, as more and more regulation goes on, um, that is just going to make it worse and worse in terms of the threats and, uh, and the risks that you face and the fact that companies are going to have it basically have to settle these cases. So fraud, as we all know, uh, under the False Claims Act now, or a false claim is now defined to include anti-kickback, uh, Stark, and we have the Medicare overpayments issue for if you retain them for over 60 days. Uh, we're still waiting on some regulations to further define that offense. The enforcement targets, and most of what I talk about today is not really going to be focused on the pharma and the medical devices, although there is um, uh, risks here. Most of this uh, really comes to bear on the providers of healthcare services, hospitals, nursing homes, ambulance companies, uh, uh, pharmacies, uh, you know, laboratory chains, uh, manufacturers of medical tests as well. Um, all of these hospices, skilled nursing facilities as they call them, all of those places are uh, on the hit list and they're on the target list and obviously uh, we've already seen the results of that. The news really under the headlines, there are several trends here in, uh, that I want to sort of set up first, and that is one, that kickback cases are on the rise. Um, there's no doubt it's a, it's a provision that has a lot of power in it. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to it in terms of the civil enforcement, uh, but criminal enforcement is absolutely up. You're seeing physicians now, uh, both the bribe uh, payers and the bribe recipients are being uh, prosecuted, and that's a big deal. So in other words, not only, uh, so physicians who uh, sort of solicit bribes uh, for, let's say, referrals or, let's say, for um, prescriptions or things like that. Um, we also have uh, laboratories, a lot of cases uh, against the laboratories and relationships between laboratories and doctors. and and kickbacks that were being given to doctors to referring uh, patients or, or sending out tests to certain laboratories. Uh, and hospitals obviously are uh, a fertile area for them to focus on. The overpayment retention issue, which I just uh, mentioned, uh, and you know, there's a lot of uh, what I would call palabra or bloviating over this by lawyers who try to scare people. Um, but the overpayment of 60 days uh, the retaining of uh, an overpayment for 60 days, we're still waiting for the definition of when somebody uh, identifies that. In other words, when you may have, you have money coming in and out of your hospital uh, for reimbursement purposes, and uh, the, the real question is when do you become aware of it for purposes of calculating the 60 days? And that has not been defined yet in regulations, although it should be soon. 
Um, Stark law enforcement is rising, and I'm not going to go through all the laws, because I'm, I'm assuming everybody is pretty familiar with them, uh, but the Stark law enforcement, uh, where physicians are referring people to or businesses that they're associated with, the classic case being a, a physician who has an x-ray facility, uh, and he or she owns it and refers them to that. There are certain, obviously, exceptions to the Stark law, as well as AKS. You know, for example, with AKS, you get discounting issues and things like that. But these, all of these are being sort of high-level prioritized for uh, prosecution. The, the cutting-edge issues in terms of enforcement now are on quality of care and, and even medical necessity. Uh, and the documentation of medical necessity and the quality of care, there's a lot of litigation going on in the False Claims Act relating to quality of care and relating to what is called worthless services. In other words, my service is so bad, my service is so bad that basically, um, you know, I, 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 I it, uh, my service is so bad that the quality of care is basically, I've provided worthless services that's worth nothing, and my getting paid by the government is by an, uh, itself uh, a type of fraud. Uh, in, in, term, uh, in terms of that situation. So quality of care is absolutely a big thing. Uh, medical necessity and documentation and, for example, uh, upcoding, up uh, billing, uh, giving people services they don't really need. We'll talk about that. Um, the other cutting edge issue that we need to, to examine is that uh, government audits and sampling is being used now to extrapolate recovery amounts. There's a big case, uh, I think it's in, uh, um, it's in the South, in Tennessee or wherever, where a judge authorized, a judge authorized basically the calculation of a penalty and the amount of fraud that was involved, or false claims that was involved, by using, uh, allowed the plaintiff to use a statistical analysis, which basically said, based upon our sample, it's clear that you know, 20% of all of these uh, claims involve fraud and the calculation of the recovery amount. Now, there's going to be more litigation over that, but to me, that's a really big danger in terms of risks uh, that's coming up. That means the government's going to have greater and greater ability with less and less work to claim larger amounts of recovery. Um, similarly, uh, we also have to be mindful that data mining techniques for identifying billing errors, particularly as everybody moves to and has moved to electronic health records, um, that is going to become more, it already is more sophisticated, but more and more the government is using that ability to identify potential fraud schemes for investigation. And just to add to everybody's headaches, uh, I mean, I can't tell you, but uh, my sense, healthcare, you folks have more risks than anyone. Uh, I don't care if you're in the financial industry, in oil and gas, or whatever, you have more risks. And just to even on top of the False Claims Act and all of the things we're talking about here, add in HIPAA uh, uh, enforcement and add in the Office of Civil Rights and doing their uh, audits from HHS and their enforcement actions for breaches. Uh, with regard to medical records and, and things like that. So throw that into the mix and we're, you know, here we go. So um, these are the new, these are sort of the headlines, uh, you know, the news under the headlines. Um, I want to sort of break it down in terms of some of the risks and then, you know, we'll obviously get to compliance, but just to sort of set the stage. Your hospital and provider risks obviously go to payment and reimbursement issues if you're, you know, dealing with Medicare or Medicaid. And we have quality of care and medical necessity. Uh, we have coding practices and how you code uh, your particular services or your particular products that you provide to patients. Uh, and in October of this year, we have a, a whole new uh, coding system coming into play, which is the ICD-10. Uh, billing practices obviously are important and electronic health records. So we have all of these payment reimbursement issues. What we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, documentation in the healthcare sector is even more important than in, you know, when we talk about anti-corruption or any other area. 
but documenting decisions and reasons for treatment and the basis for the treatment becomes absolutely critical uh, in this process. So charting uh, medical actions is really important. Uh, and what does that mean? You've got to get uh, doctors and other medical professionals to uh, actually you know, spend some time to chart something carefully. Well, that's tough to do. We also have what are called the RAC audits, which everybody knows about, the recovery audit contractors who basically come in, audit your Medicare patient, uh, payments uh, for hospitals, doctors, and whatnot. But, you know, I like uh, they're sort of uh, headhunters or scalp hunters in the sense that they're given a bounty fee. They get a certain percentage of whatever they recover. They have an incentive to make the recovery as large as possible. Uh, for overpayments of hospitals and doctors because they get a, a, a percentage back. Now what they've been doing in their latest trend, and I don't think it's that late, but it's been going on for a while, is medical necessity documentation for acute care, cardiovascular procedures, uh, and minor surgical procedures which are treated as sort of inpatient procedures. In other words, if they can second guess you on treating somebody inpatient when they should have been outpatient, uh, purposes, they're going to do that. Uh, acute care, you get into really difficult situations, and uh, stents and cardiovascular procedures uh, become very sort of uh, troublesome in terms of how these are done and what are the criteria that are used. Hospitals face huge risks with regard to physicians uh, in their relationships with physicians. Uh, obviously, it makes it easier when your physician is a hospital employee as opposed to a person that you contract with. But uh, assuming that they are a, a uh, contractor, those relationships can become very difficult as well as uh, employees. Uh, you can get into uh, issues with, uh, with anti-kickback in terms of their relationships with uh, pharma companies and medical device companies. Um, and obviously we have plenty of regulatory risks, like I said. We have data security issues which grow out of uh, the meaningful use and electronic health records requirements and obviously with HIPAA. These are all issues that are, are just, it's mind numbing to think about all the risks that are involved uh, when you're in the, in the healthcare industry. So you have also, you have your, uh, your kickback, your anti-kickback risks which have increased. Um, we also have to, in your physician hospital type of relationship, look at uh, business ventures that physicians may have outside of the hospital and the relationship that they have. In other words, imaging centers, laboratories, or equipment. Uh, you know, in some places now, physicians are creating what are called pods, uh, physician owned distributorships, and those raise real interesting issues as to. Uh, physicians being uh, having an ownership interest in that and there's been sort of a pushback by HHS and even Capitol Hill got involved at one time or even physical therapy clinics get into that as well. Uh, hospitals have to be careful how they recruit their doctors and the inducements that they do to bring them to the hospital because they can't basically say hey you come in here we'll give you here's the classic violation. We'll give you this uh, office space here in our hospital grounds. Uh, we'll give it to you at a dollar a month for the rent. And by the way, you have to refer every one of your patients to the hospital. Well, that's not going to work. Uh, the hospitals basically can't offer an illegal recruitment, inducement, and in this case, uh, offering uh, rent for a dollar. Uh, it has to be rent that's done at fair market value. And uh, they can't start to say to physicians, hey, you have to increase your uh, referrals to the hospital or make sure that all of your uh, referrals go to this hospital. Um, the physicians also have interesting relationships with vendors. Um, in other words, uh, doctors uh, have to be careful. Uh, they're given free samples, uh, but they can't bill Medicare for their free samples uh, from pharmaceutical companies. And pharmaceutical companies, uh, you have to be careful in terms of how they are providing uh, samples and samples to uh, doctors for purposes of trying out certain medications or medical devices. Um, and then physicians obviously have the classic relationships with pharmaceutical and medical device companies in terms of consulting, in terms of uh, 
You know, there are equipment trials that are done with medical device companies. There are other types of arrangements uh, designed to increase uh, physician prescriptions or physician use. Those, obviously, if they're designed for that purpose, that's not going to be good. There's got to be an independent, uh, valuable purpose to their relationship or their participation, for example, in medical education programs or things like that. So we, I'm sort of just running through the risks real quickly just so we can set up basically what needs to be done in the healthcare sector with an ethics and compliance program. And, um, and I sort of want to start with, uh, you know, why again, and I know this is a profound grasp of the obvious why this is important, but one of the most important things that a company or a healthcare provider can do is to get, you have to try to convince the government not to intervene in a false claims act case. Hopefully, let's go through the mechanics again. The KTM relator files a complaint. Uh, they file it under seal and they give a copy. It's filed in the court system and they give a copy to the uh, government. The government uh, usually will investigate the False Claims Act, and in many cases you can get wind that this investigation is going on. Um, <clears throat> they may get documents, you may get a CID subpoena, you may get a CID request for uh, information, or you may hear about people being solicited for information by the government. Uh, sometimes that's because they're trying to decide whether or not to intervene in that case. The better your ethics and compliance program is, the better the argument you have uh, against the government for intervening. And even if they do intervene or even if they don't intervene, at some point it gives you a better argument for why the recovery should be smaller. Um, and so the more that you have an effective compliance program you know, that's, that's working well, the better you're able to ar argue that any type of violation was isolated or an aberrant event, it really, you know, was uh, something that's not part of your fabric and you're not sort of involved in that type of activity, but it just so happened. Um, so they're also, to me, in terms of, and people uh, have heard me say this over and over again, the, the fact of an effective compliance program is not just to prevent sort of bad things from happening, but there are positive benefits. People are more productive, companies are more, I think, profitable in the long run, and uh, there's less sort of turnover of employees and less disruption, and you have a reduced misconduct. So if you have a, a culture of compliance and ethics, there's so many positive benefits to it that it's a worthwhile thing. You also have to dedicate a adequate resources to that compliance function. And in the healthcare sector, I think it's traditional and I think it's historical, but the health force sector is notoriously understaffed in terms of compliance. Um, and uh, one of the other more important issues is uh, risk assessments and the ability to identify risks, prioritize risks, and then to tailor or assign resources and your program to those risks. Uh, and then most importantly, the best indicator of a vibrant compliance program is a robust monitoring and auditing program because of all the regulatory requirements, all the documentation, all the data that's kept for billing purposes and for other regulatory purposes. Uh, for that reason, it gives you lots and lots of information, if not too to much information, that you have to have a robust uh, monitoring and auditing uh, function. That's what's critical. So, and I'm not going to go through the basic compliance program elements, but here they are in terms of uh, all of the all of the um, you know requirements or the general requirements, which we're all familiar with. We've seen them over and over. Um, but I want to sort of move beyond that. I don't want to go through this and sort of repeat this. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows what type of uh, elements have to be there. And what I'm going to try to do is focus on sort of five or so important elements and what needs to be done sort of to take uh, at least what I've seen and what I believe in the healthcare sector there needs to be uh, a focus on. So in my view, and uh, is, is that healthcare compliance has to be reinvented, and I think it's in the process of being reinvented. 
Um, it needs to be reinvigorated. Here's uh, my theory on this, and uh, is that because uh, compliance was pushed so much in the 90s, and the separation of the sort of compliance function out of the legal function, uh, what really happened as a result of that, even though it was pushed out uh, in the 90s through the government's efforts uh, and uh, sort of the tenant health care and other, uh, the, the OIG was very instrumental in this and in pushing people to uh, create independent uh, compliance functions. Well, they did that, and a lot of healthcare companies did that, and a lot of hospitals did that, but they forgot one thing. They forgot to empower and make sure that this was a strong function within the hospital, and number two, they forgot to give them any resources to do the job. So a lot of cases what we see are uh, sort of backwater compliance programs that aren't given sort of the attention that they need. Now, that's changing because of the enforcement environment and because of the rigorous enforcement that's going on, it's starting to change. But what needs to be done is we, there's not just a need for renewed commitment. In my, in my view, there needs to be a reevaluation of techniques and how things are being done. Um, I'm not looking to build you know, the Cadillac for everybody, uh, and, you know, if you have a healthcare system that cuts across, you know, an entire region, okay, that's great. I'm not going to try to build the, the biggest Cadillac. I'm not going to assume you have resources like that. But to me, there there has to be a reevaluation, a reprioritization of what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do, and what hospitals and other providers are trying to do. And to me, it starts with what I would say are these uh, five principles, and I've sort of both, you know, I want to sort of focus on these uh, because without the board and the board commitment and involvement, it's got to start from the top, and I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but you can see the HHS is unhappy about the absence of board commitment. You can see that the Justice Department doesn't like that. It's a universal, universal theme. The fact is you have all these corporate integrity agreements now that are requiring, uh, you know, board members to sign individually as to their certifying as to their commitment and their compliance and their efforts that were required under the CIA, uh, and board members are signing individually. So what the government's saying is we don't see the commitment. We don't see that you're involved. We don't see that you're pushing this. We don't see that you're conducting proper oversight and monitoring of the compliance program. And part of the reason is because they're not getting, uh, there's not a commitment, but they also don't know how to create information flow back and discussion systems that give them access to the information that they need. They're not being sort of what I would say proactive in this area. They also do not, in my view, is there needs to be a re-emphasis re on the culture of ethics. In other words, how do you create an ethical culture? How do you make it permeate? How do you get it throughout your organization? Everything about compliance right now in the healthcare sector is about just trying to keep up with all the regulations, and I get that. But what needs to be done is as you increase resources, you need to put this up as a high priority, which is culture of ethics. The structure. Uh, we still see chief compliance officers who are, you know, down in the basement in a corner office uh, in the basement or in a smaller office than that with a staff of one and supposed to take care of a hospital systems or a ho even an individual hospital's uh, compliance uh, program. That to me is, uh, you know, you might as well call yourself a backwater CCO. At that point in time, you, the statement is made very clear with that type of arrangement that this is not an empowered or independent CCO. This is basically a check the box CCO. And the structure that you want to see is it's very important to set up an executive level compliance committee, not with all board members and not so that it's just a rehearsal of sort of compliance presentations to the board. I'm talking about a real working executive compliance committee and the membership of that committee, uh, particularly with regard to quality issues, has to include uh, a physician, a, a director of quality, that type, uh, you've got to see your committee and your compliance committee taking on a broader function. I can always tell where, where somebody is 
with regard to who's a member of the compliance committee, if they have one, and whether or not they have positions on there, whether they have quality of care, whether they have all of these types of issues that need to be addressed represented on that committee, not just your standard HR, lawyers, and financial uh, auditors. Um, and you, the other point that, that we have to start thinking about in the healthcare industry more is to focus on the right risks. And that means risk assessments and risk prioritization. The biggest way you can start to help your company is by focusing on the risks where there's the greatest financial exposure or reputational exposure. And the way you can do that is by looking at, in your risk assessment process, looking at what are, what's the exposure here, how much money is involved in this, and how much money could I be held accountable for with regard to this activity or this type of activity. And obviously, I'm going to push the last and probably most important issue, which is if you're not auditing and monitoring your process through a variety of techniques, all your processes, your procedures, then you're in, in deep trouble because then the government's going to be doing uh, the government's going to be doing that uh, for you. So uh, uh, we're going to basically go through that and talk a little bit more about some of these uh, ideas in terms of this. Like I said, healthcare boards now are under really tough scrutiny. They're under scrutiny uh, because uh, HHS and OIG, the OIG basically have said, we don't see our governing boards doing as much as they should do on compliance oversight. So they issued, obviously, with the help of the American Health Lawyers Association and other people, they put together a really very valuable uh, guidance book, and I urge everybody to look at it, the Practical Guidance for Healthcare Governing Boards. So what the, the message is is that corporate boards have to improve oversight and monitoring. So how do you do that? Well, one of the issues is you have to set up certain structural requirements. You have to set up a, a reporting obligation that's at least quarterly where uh, compliance comes in and spends time with the board. You also have to have whatever board member or board committee oversees compliance, be it the audit committee or be it a compliance committee, uh, you have to see a positive relationship, a positive relationship between the compliance profession, uh, the CCO, and the uh, head of the committee. There has to be that. Board training has got to be a regular practice and it's got to be documented that you did it, uh, particularly because of the increased oversight uh, of uh, corporate boards uh, in the healthcare set setting. You want regular reporting from the functions like we're talking about here, compliance, legal, human resources, quality, and audit. There has to be a new commitment to increase this time and information uh, that the board dedicates to compliance. It's up to the compliance person, the legal person, everybody to sort of, uh, you know, push the board. You've got to get more involved in this. You've got to spend more time on this. Uh, and because of these individual certifications that are being required in the CIA context, it, you don't want to get in that position where individual members can become liable uh, for failure to follow through on their specific uh, commitments. So we, one of the things that you can use as a way to get your board more involved is to take this guidance and say, look, these guys are concerned about it. We need to address this. And what what, do, what can we do together to make sure that our board is as protected as possible in this situation? And that's something that we're spending time with in terms of educating. We're trying, we're, we're making presentations to boards to say, board, you've got to be more involved in uh, this compliance activity. Now, and, and uh, hopefully you can attend, or I know that these are issues that sound great as a matter of theory. But, you know, you're under a regulatory burden. You have new regulations, new Medicare regulations coming out all the time where you have things that you just are mind-numbing in terms of how much paperwork you have to deal with. But there is a value to attending to your culture of compliance. And by that, I mean if we can get the board more involved, we get senior management involved, and we try to embed more of a culture of compliance. Senior executives have to take the tools that are done in other industries and apply them in this industry. In other words, give senior executives requirements for their um, position 
that they have to dedicate a certain amount of time to uh, compliance. Obviously, employees want to get employees who are basically uh, one of their uh, evaluation elements uh, for their annual reviews is going to include, hopefully, uh, ethics and compliance. The training message uh, has to be reiterated over and over, and the culture has to be monitored and measured. So don't you don't have to necessarily take a survey of your entire you know 20 hospitals in a healthcare system. You can take why not take what you think is a higher risk hospital and just measure the culture in that one hospital. Report it to the board. Monitor it. In other words, use as many tools as you can to measure your culture beyond just the, the system-wide employee surveys. Culture has to be monitored. You have to work closely with HR to do this, but you've got to monitor it and measure it and report it to the board. Bring the board into the culture issue. It's up to you as a chief compliance officer to say to the uh, board, this is an important issue. I'm going to report to you on it. Not just the number of complaints we got, not just how many people have been trained and certified. I want to tell you about our culture and whether the message of compliance is getting through. And if we need more of a message, that means you, CEO, that means you, senior manager, have to step up and communicate more. And even the chairman of the board has to do that as well. You've got to communicate and send more messages. You have got to think of ways that you can get the message out. We've talked about the importance of the independent and empowered CCO um, and, and the legacy role here and the resources that have to be expanded and coordinated closely with internal audit. Internal audit is a very close partner, particularly in the healthcare sector and should be as part of the healthcare sector uh, for the CCO. So these are important these are important principles, the independence and empowering. You want to move the CCO up from the basement to the C-suite. That's where the CCO belongs. You don't see it that often now in the healthcare sector. You start to see it in other industries, and healthcare is behind in this issue. So I talked a, uh, a little bit about uh, risk assessment and the importance of a risk assessment. And here, to me, is one of the critical issues where people get lost in the healthcare sector. It's so easy to, for example, just say we're going to deal with all of our risks. But the problem that I have with that is you have a limited amount of resources. So what ends up happening is people don't get anything done as to any of the risks. And they're spread so thin that they can't get to anything. And I know that you want to be able to say, we've identified all of our risks and we're responding to all of our risks. And in the end, what I see is there, the companies and healthcare companies are behind in terms of mitigating their risks and even prioritizing the risks. That's what I wanted to try to do, is to prioritize the risks on an ongoing basis. What is the nature of the risk? What is your exposure? What is the downside of the risk? And what is the amount of money involved in that risk area or reputational risks or cultural risks if we don't address this? So the risk complement obviously is going to change depending upon you know, the type of provider that you are. If you're a durable medical equipment provider, you're going to have a different set of risks than if you're a hospital, obviously. So there, the, what I what I don't, uh, what I see a lot of times are very immature sort of risk uh, assessment processes and risk ranking, risk prioritization, and the ability then to take those risks and then tailor a compliance program in response to that. Um, and I know it doesn't it sounds uh, critical, but what I'm saying is you know, this is a basic function of any compliance function a basic task that has to be done, which is to take your risks, identify them, and evaluate them, and weigh them, and prioritize them. Amount of money of your activity is really important. In other words, if you're incurring a risk that only involves $10 worth of expenditures, as opposed to uh, a risk that is involving a million dollars, and the potential payment, let's say, with treble damages under the F the False Claims Act could be $3 million. Obviously, that's going to be more important to you 
than, let's say, a higher risk activity that only involves $10. That's what I'm saying as a theoretical matter. So the importance of risk assessment and the importance of a risk assessment to the functioning of your program is absolutely critical. We need to see this step up, more sophisticated risk assessments. And then we need to tailor the key elements of a compliance pr program of a compliance program has to be tailored to those risks. So what am I talking about? Documentation is the key. Documentation is the key. Um, and uh, so we look at uh, every function and how we document things. But here the thing, the thing in the healthcare industry is this. It's not just about whether or not you document, because there are a lot of things that are by, na by their nature always documented. But it's now we're going to get into the quality of the documentation itself. What exactly is being written down? What, uh, because a lot of it depends upon judgments that are made right at the scene or right at this time or uh, without any sort of review or any sort of quality control. And so there's a lot of documentation that's done without sort of uh, relying on or understanding the consequences or the importance of that. And that is an educational and training thing, and a lot of times your audience are the providers themselves, the physicians, uh, the nurses, the skilled nurses, whatever. Those are going to be some of the people that are going to be your target audience for how you're documenting things and how things are then written down and what is the justification for certain things that we're doing. Medical necessity, like I said, is a requirement. And uh, there are various screening tools uh, in terms of coverage guidance. Uh, there's national claims uh, definitions, you know, that are being, that are more in vogue, uh, that are being used now that give you certain trigger or key phrases or key findings that need to be included for a medical necessity determination. And where people lose on the False Claims Act is when they fail to include any evidence of those important uh, determinants, as we could say, for demonstrating medical necessity. And a lot of times it then comes down to just what do people say about it. And your ability to fight a claim as being, you know, let's say improper is dependent upon whether or not you have that key documentation whether you have those key phrases used, the determinant between one level of service and the other level of service uh, can be based upon key phrases that are used in the documentation. And there, and there are ways to sort of improve that. And that's what one of the things uh, in terms of training and targeted training and targeted communications to the people who are doing that in terms of how to best uh, ensure that we have the best documentation that we can. Um, we also focus on billing and reimbursement procedures and to make sure that they're accurate. Uh, we've seen a lot of sloppy billing and reimbursement, particularly with electronic health records, and then that leads to the government thinking, uh, oh gosh, we've got a conspiracy here, when in fact it may be just lazy or sloppy behavior. Uh, is uh, very, it, it occurs a very often in terms of uh, billing for Medicare. Uh, you know, I see too many situations where people are cutting and pasting the same uh, information and then lo and behold, they forget to change. You know, they put the same patient name or patient identification and, uh, and all of a sudden we've got a billing problem. Next is quality reviews. And one of the key elements that I see in terms of quality reviews and monitoring, because quality is now becoming a big issue and everybody is focusing on this, is to set up what I would call a committee review or independent review for quality in close cases. In other words, that we can get um, a reading from uh, the, an independent committee that is supposed to look at a situation and say, this is the type of quality service that this person uh, deserves, and this is the way it should be done. So um, those are the quality review and the monitoring with the committee review uh, in close cases, bring in an, an external 
sort of forced to rubber, uh, not rubber stamp, but to stamp it, okay, uh, to say that this is okay. Um, it rarely leads to a change in the outcome or the change in what's done, but it, it actually bolsters the case and provides good documentation. Your utilization statistics, uh, I always say, and I'm going to repeat this over and over, if the government's going to audit you and they're going to look at your records or they're monitoring your records, you better be monitoring your records as well. I always say you, you need to have what the government has and you need to be able to look at it and, uh, and go from there. So you have to set up a system within your compliance program to look at your utilization statistics, look for patterns before the government finds the patterns, and do your own internal analysis with regard to that. Um, you also need to set up what I call an internal review process for any physician relationships. Any contract, anything is going to go through a rigorous internal view, review to make sure the contract is clear, that there's no sort of hanky-panky going on with the physicians and bringing physicians into a hospital or, bringing, or, ha or setting up a contract relationship where they provide certain services as well. Uh, we need, obviously, into a rigorous or robust internal investigations function because a lot of fraud issues, you'll, you'll be amazed, actually come up through uh, complaints. Complaints internally, sometimes there are complaints that are uh, about sort of uh, fraud issues or concerns about overutilization of, let's say, uh, certain services, that there's you know double x-rays being charged for what should be a single x-ray. Um, and you're going to find out about those things. And so you may find out about them. And if you do, you have to sort of move quickly, investigate it. You have to remediate it as quickly as you can. Uh, and we have, obviously, over and over my uh, mantra of auditing and monitoring that has to be done. So when I say physician relationships and we need robust controls that are needed for that, we need it for all compensation arrangements. Any situation where we have a contract with a physician uh, and we're trying to get referrals or we're trying to get recruits, uh, uh, recruit physicians to affiliate with our hospital, um, we have to look at every benefit that's given to them and make sure that it's fair market value. Uh, we will lease them space, but it's got to be at fair market value. And that is like a due diligence file in a sense. It's got to be documented. It's got to be supported. And there's got to be solid evidence that that is a reasonable price for the uh, lease, let's say. Uh, contract has to be cleaned up, but also ha the relationship has to be audited to make sure that there's no other sort of benefits going to the physicians, how's it working, there's no reason to just take a five-year contract, throw it in a file, and never look at it again once it's approved. You want to make sure that you're looking at what payments are being made, what, how is the contract working out, uh, are, the pay, are they acting in accordance with this, look at the referral numbers, look at how many patients are coming in, and, and try to anticipate what the government would say in those types of situations because people are watching over that. There's plenty of people to watch over that, and that has to do with your whistleblowers. So we've talked about quality and why quality of care is the new enforcement priority. Um, and quality data reports now have to be made for you know Medicare and Medicaid. And this quality data is now going to be mined by the government in terms of going after uh, the types of services and the quality of the service and whether or not it's a worthless service or it's a service that's below the standard of care, there's still that is still being litigated and I can uh, and I expect that it's going to continue to be litigated. Uh, we've had two circuits that have sort of come in on this issue. So uh, and if you look at what the corporate integrity agreements have for health and hospital systems, they have they're setting up independent quality monitors who are literally looking over the shoulder uh, to see the quality uh, because the concerns are that people are shortchanging uh, the Medicare patients, getting the money, and moving on. Um, they also, quality issues are designated as a reportable event. For example, it has to be reported to the government. Um, we're also uh, there, we're also seeing provisions where uh, clinical quality systems are reviewed, medical necessity 
is reviewed, that there are internal review processes to make sure that quality is being maintained. My only concern with regard to all of the quality is that it's going to be the quality focus and quality review is that it's going to become a sort of minimum standard requirement internally. And you have to be careful about that. So how do you bring quality? How do you bring this whole notion of quality, which needs to be brought into compliance? Well, you obviously forge the relationships that you need with the people in your compliance committee. So your co compliance committee is going to consist of the, the people who do the hard work here. So for example, your chief medical officer or a representative has to be at the compliance committee meetings, hopefully, and you have a director of quality, and you have to work with these folks to try to bring about sort of more education, more realization of this issue, and that there's going to be more sort of reviews, internal reviews. And in when you have reviews and uh, monitoring and that types of things, I'm not talking about looking at every case. I'm talking about using sampling, using appropriate sampling techniques to try to get a flavor for what is going on. So you also, the chief compliance officer should participate in quality meetings, any board level or senior management level meeting relating to quality and ensuring quality of care or the quality of care that is brought by uh, the providers, they need to be participating in that. Uh, you try to meet with your quality staff, the quality uh, director of quality staff and the legal department and the uh, compliance function should be together and working on this. We also want to review what are called the PEPPER reports, you know, the, quality, the uh, patterns of the billing and the patterns of service reports that go to Medicare and uh, whatnot or are generated. We want to get those reports and uh, start to look at that and focus on unusual patterns of uh, providing services and you want to look at the quality in your annual compliance program. So quality has got to be brought into the mix. And going back to what the committee should be doing, your committee, your, your compliance committee, has to include the typical people. It needs to include, uh, obviously, your chief medical officer, your director of quality, your IT people, your billing people, the billing representative, and person responsible for coding and coding training uh, should be there, as well as your legal, your internal audit, uh, function as well as your financial representative uh, and you want to have and make sure that they're all at the table and these are the workers, the people who can get things done. I don't want this to be just a rehearsal for a board presentation. It's got to be a committee that meets uh, regularly and gets things done because this is an ongoing maintenance issue. So monitoring and audits is is really the telltale sign. If you look at a uh, program and you don't see any monitoring or audits, that or it's not very robust, you know you've got problems. Uh, because this is the main way that information comes back and on a more continuous basis, uh, this is the main way that you can identify a problem early on. We're looking at documentation, we're looking at billing, we're looking at charting, we're looking at uh, what records are being uh, kept. You want to use random sampling as much as you can to basically um, sort of leverage your limited resources and you want to prioritize your monitoring and, act, uh, and audits by what's high risk. And again, we're going back to our risk assessment process. Your internal auditor should be obviously involved with that. Uh, this is a partnership type deal because the risk assessment is critical for figuring out how, how to um, assign resources as you're sort of uh, trying to manage your risks and bring them down. Audits can be designed for various purposes. We obviously focus on coding, billing, documentation, all the things that I've talked about, quality of care, standards of care, medical decisions and services that are provided. Um, look some of the specific risks areas that have been focused on by the government are observation periods, short stays, medical support for procedures, uh, over, over utilization risks with regard to stents and things like that. These audit reports have to be, they don't have to be these fancy formal rip everything apart type of audits. These can be quick in and out audits. Uh, 
uh, that are done and there have to be enough sampling that it becomes relevant, but you audit uh, also your hospital physician relationships uh, and those should be audited as well. Um, and we have quality of care audits that we've talked about, quality of care issues that require careful documentation. You adopt quality of care standards and you audit. You look at, and for example, the three sort of highest priorities have been stents, short stay admissions from the government that they've been looking at, and implantable uh, cardio defibrillators. So auditing needs to focus to make sure the that the service orders are clear, the justification is explained in the rec records, and uh, like I said before, we consider using an independent review committee to affirm a decision in a close case. Here it's really dependent upon your relationship with the medical staff to ensure that there's buy-in to your oversight program. You have to explain to them the consequences, the reasons, and now the you know, the fact that we do have criminal potential liability in these false, well, or otherwise civil false claims act cases. So you, uh, and you want to avoid that uh, quality be care becomes sort of the minimum standard of care, but here communication, working, training, uh, being present, uh, you know, it's a tough job, I agree, but it's got to be um, something that's got to be attended to and promoted. We've talked about internal reporting systems and investigations. Obviously, we have all the, the, the requirements of anonymity, you know, anonymous reporting systems. We have to make sure that the internal investigation function is, prior, is, is working effectively, it's prioritized, uh, that there is, um, you know, quick resolution and, of course, fair resolutions, as I've spoken of before. This is a critical to the speak up culture, it's critical to uh, promoting what I would call a culture of ethics that people care, that people care about potential problems. Whistleblowers are obviously one of the greatest dangers and one of the great, greatest uh, dangers for whistleblowers is uh, the False Claims Act and the clear payments that they get, uh, the uh, 10 to 30 percent. Um, treatment of uh, whistleblowers is absolutely critical again because uh, they provide significant information on unnecessary, wasteful services, fraudulent billing, um, a, you know, almost all of these significant cases they start with a whistleblower. There's a very sort of mature uh, bar that's out there, lawyers who are ready and willing and able to help these whistleblowers and we all know what the risks are like. So, we want to try to create, as the internal investigation function works, that please bring us your concerns, bring us your complaints, we'll respond to them. A lot of times a whistleblower, all they want is just to be heard, and that's it. Uh, so the more that you can create a system where they uh, don't feel they have to go outside the system, the better. Uh, training and communication is an absolutely critical thing. and. What I'd like to see more in the healthcare sector are targeted training programs for specific functions. In other words, a training program on coding, a training program on documentation uh, for justification for services, your chart for services. In other words, give people real practical advice. Do not just sit there and go, here's the False Claims Act and it's really bad, or here are the state regulatory requirements, here are the federal re regulatory requirements. Spend time on the specific risks and bring in smaller audiences that are targeted just to that risk. Make your training valuable. Don't make it general. Don't make it, you know, oh, check that box, we've done that. Billing and coding issues, chart documentation, specific training programs that are going to be helpful um, so that you have at this time in, uh, some specific way of trying to start a dialogue. It's the best way to start a dialogue with your staff is in a training type program and put an overarching Pro, put an overarching issue of this is being brought to you by our ethics culture, which is coming from the board, which is you know regularly communicated to you, and put it in that context. And then you're going to start to see more of a buy-in, I think, to that. 
Um, and people want guidance. Uh, a lot of times what I hear is people just want some advice and some help on a particular issue. Um, well, we're kind of uh, late here for questions because we're right at the end of the hour. Um, but if you do have any, please send them to me. Uh, at, uh, we, uh, you can send it to me at my uh, uh, email address. The phone number there got cut off. It's 240-505-1992. Uh, we work a lot with healthcare uh, uh, entities in terms of doing risk and compliance program assessments. We can come in, we uh, we create uh, what I think are uh, very positive assessments and things that need to be done to take you to the next level. It helps you to get resources. We're very strong advocates for a compliance program and the benefits of it. Um, and uh, people have had uh, good success with us. We also can help you in designing your auditing and monitoring program and strategies. Obviously, we deal a lot with HAS and start block problems that come up, um, but probably our best service that we can really help you with is take a look at your program, look at the risks and your compliance program, and come up with sort of 10 action items that would be the best to focus on. Um, and we've done that for uh, other uh, other clients, and it's been uh, very productive uh, in terms of what we can do for you. Um, so please stay in touch. Uh, again, this is the recording of this will go into uh, the Volkov Law TV subscription service. I hope you subscribe. Please uh, please do so. Uh, and like I said before, there's a 20% uh, discount if you subscribe prior to uh, the end of June. So we've still got time. So do that and uh, appreciate it. And we'll be back in touch with more webinars coming up in the next uh, few weeks. And thank you again, and please stay in touch. Bye-bye.